You're Roman. So I turned the temperature down. Yeah, I opened nice. up the doors. It's nice in here. And it's down to a thousand. So it. What was it when you started? Oh, in privacy pass. Yeah, privacy pass was here. And it popped up to 1800. So I got here half an hour early, opened up everything. So when it was just Peter and I, it actually bought down to seven something. Yeah. We just have to stop breathing. For those of you who might have been hearing, the air quality is not great in the small rooms. It's been really stuffy, so I've opened up the door. So if you guys get cool, just let me know. We can try and figure out how to adjust the temperature for those that are in the room. It's like two factions. You want me to do that? I mean, I, oh, I yeah, you. Oh. I got it. I need a shirt with the skim logo for. For these days, like my OAuth shirts. Correct. Then yeah. you, you have Just to get them. Yeah. yeah. All right. You want me to get? Did you want to share slides? What do you want? Welcome to my different room. I can talk to you from the slides if you would like. I can even get plugged in though. I can run time and the queue. Okay, well, while we're trying to get up and set up, uh, we could really use one more note taker. We've got Rohit. Oh, and Bart. Okay. So it'd be great if you can capture the discussion, especially if there are questions as well. Um, that'll make our, our jobs easier when we post the minutes. What's wrong? Oh, <laughs> you just unplugged the queue, that's all. <laughs> it's okay. See? Word disappeared. I don't know. I'm not worried because I can see the queue here. Go, go, go ahead and start. I need to figure out how to get this. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. No, that was Oh, how dare. All right. What's that? No, he's a remote. Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the SKIM working group session. Um, it is Thursday. If you were expecting to be listening to something other than how we do provisioning management of identities, uh, you're probably in the wrong session. So welcome. It is Thursday. So hopefully by now you're familiar with the note well. It gives us the code of conduct and the policies for how we run the ITF sessions. Um, I am going to presume you're all familiar with it so that we can get on with the schedule. So administrative um, tasks, so thank you Ro Rohit and Bart for being the note takers. We no longer need the blue sheets, but <clears throat> in absence of that, of that, please make sure you sign in. You can use the QR code and if it disappears, there's the keeping to the old style, there should be a QR code floating around if you need it. Ah, it's on the back. All right, <clears throat> and I will try and channel the, uh, the Zulip so that we don't need to worry about having a, a Zulip watcher. Okay, agenda bashing. So we've got some drafts that have been adopted um, and not quite adopted that we wanna go through. I'm not gonna list them out by one, but you can see it. 
I wanted to see if anybody had any comments or changes to the agenda. We do have a full agenda, so going once, going twice. Okay, so with that, Paolo, are you presenting or is Pam presenting? I'll present. You'll uh, present? Can you share the slides? Yes. yes. <clears throat> <laughs> come on, come on, it's not that bad. Would you like me to turn up the temperature? No. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So I'll be quick. I, I don't think I need 15 minutes, it's just five minutes just to from I'm the last clock you. Sorry? I'm gonna clock you. Okay, okay. So from the last meeting in ITF, at that time me and Pam present what we have in the use case, mm -hmm. right? The different uh, slides uh, explaining the challenge. Meanwhile, after uh, that meeting, we had a couple of conversations and we saw that we have three new challenges that we didn't discover, uh, discover before and that we like to share with you and uh, we are open to more challenges that you think that exist today. Okay. So, uh, Mike? There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 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 much better. Okay, so first, first challenge, and that challenge was brought in the conversation that we had with Delta Queries, right? It's about the reconciliation. That uh, imagine that there is uh, uh, several uh, resource objects with resource attributes that are pushed from the client to the server. And then for some reason, the server changed it or by some inconsistent, something changed there. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that now the client understands that the server has different records because the client is not aware. So at that point, there is nothing that can happen between uh, for the client to, to trigger the update again. So it's a big problem that we have to address today that you have servers that can manipulate the information, the resource objects and resource attributes and gets to inconsistence that are never fixed until the client again receives some kind of changes in that record. That is the first challenge. The second challenge, and we already covered this a little bit in the previous presentation, it's about the HR application. So now we have the entities that, uh, for instance, Workday, that have uh, information about resource objects mm -hmm. and resource attributes that they, don't, uh, they want to update to the clients and they want to make sure that then there are different applications that can subscribe to that. So they are not manipulating the information. They are not providing that information to other SaaS applications, but they are providing that information to the IBMs that manage that information, right? So we no longer have that simple model of client server that you have an entity that talks to another entity and that's it and it stops there. Now we have different resource objects with different attributes that maybe they are not even authorized. And I'm very careful when I talk about authorized because that is a dirty word in, uh, in provisioning. But think about it. Now, the provision source for resource attributes for the IRAs can come from different uh, scheme elements in, the, in, in, the, in our use cases. So that is a challenge that we need to address at some point not the authorized, but who is the owner or who is the person that needs to be authoritative for that specific resource attribute. And finally, and this is a use case that was already described before, that we need to give more thought into it. More and more, we start to have models where different SaaS applications are the authorized elements for specific attributes. I'll give you a simple example. Let's imagine that we have, for instance, uh, an IDM, something like an Okta, that uh, has all the different attributes for the users, but then one of those attributes, let's say the email address, it's not, authorized, it's not Okta that needs to create it. It's created by an external source, let's say a Google 
Google provides that attribute for the user and it should automatically provision. Today, the only way that we have to do that is through manual process or through proprietary APIs where you can update Okta or the IDMs to fill up that, that attribute. We need to find a way that now attributes can come from different sources. And these are the three challenges that we decided also to bring to the use case that we need to address at some point with best practice and with protocols that allow us to do that. So next slide. This is, uh, this is yes. Yes, exactly. This is what we normally see today. This is normal model that all of us are used to, right? So we have an IDM that is the scheme client. That IDM does resource management and all these terms, resource management, resource creator, resource updater, resource subscriber, it's covering that use case draft that uh, Nancy showed in the beginning that is in the data track. So they will be the ones that are the authoritative, let's call it like that, for the attributes. And they are going to do a get in the push, a normal operation to the SaaS application that is going to receive that information. This is what we are used to today. But now, how do we address with this kind of model the challenge that we described before? We don't have any way. So there are two possible trends, and maybe there are more. We only thought about two, and we are open to other suggestions that can address that. And that's what we need to think as a group. If these two trends are good enough, and then we would need to do best practice, which one to follow based on different conditions of the SaaS application, the, the SaaS creator, the scheme creator of the application, and how to address that, right? So next slide. The first one, and I apologize that there is a small bug in the slides. So where you see scheme server, it should say scheme server and scheme client. And the same thing in the other side that says scheme client should say both, right? So one of the options that has been described, and again, I don't think we have any implementations of it yet, but the option will be that each one of those components the IDM and the SaaS application, both of them are scheme servers and scheme clients. This address the case of the reconcil reconciliation of the information. This address the use case of the extra attributes. And each one of them will be able to push to the other ones the information that they think that they change. We know that each scheme client have their own change database. So if everything, anything changed, it will be updated to the other direction. Of course, and we were discussing this just a couple of minutes ago, this will require a heavy implementation from the scheme implementers today, because normally either they are scheme clients or they are scheme servers. Asking them to implement both will be much more complex. Okay, so we need to figure it out when we go to the best practice, when do we recommend that? Option number two in the next slide. Okay, so Pam wanted just to clarify yes. the acronyms that RM is resource manager, RC is? Resource creator, RU is resource updater, RS is resource subscriber. Yep. All of that is defined in the, the draft. Okay. So the other option, and this option goes to the work that uh, Danny and Angeli are already, uh, pro uh, already pre uh, show before to us, is we keep the same roles. So a client is a client, a server is a server, but the client will do, uh, will, will do gets that they can get deltas. Now, all that Delta Z specify, it's in the protocol that Angela is going to talk about in a moment. Think about it. So let's say that for some reason, the server detects that something it's not correct and that mechanism, maybe it's outside the scheme protocol, and then is going to return a Delta since the last check-in. And this can address the use cases that we already described before. 
and we have a question from Josh, and, and I'm finished from the slide perspective. George Fletcher, Capital One. I guess because we're making the assertion that a SaaS application can be authoritative for an attribute, the question is, is how does the server know who's authoritative for the attribute, right? There's some layer that has to go in here to say, you know, Google can update email address, but they can't update age or something else. Okay, so we discussed that a couple of times before. We think, and that's why I say authoritative is a dirty word in sure. here, right? Because it's outside the scope. I think there needs to be some kind of policy agreement between both that they define their own policies that says between them, this is always a, an one-to-one -one agreement. They say, you are authoritative for that agreement. But again, I think that will be outside the scope of the protocol. Well, it it, the logic it, itself. Yeah, I, I worry about it from a deployment perspective, though. If we make it outside the protocol, the likelihood <laughs> is that it will not get deployed correctly. And so that may be something that we want to consider. Yes. And Dean, we discussed that before. Go for it. Hi, Dean Sachs from AWS. Um, George, I think to address your question, uh, months ago we spoke about this. And what I heard, and I would appreciate the chairs confirming this, is that authorization is out of scope for this group to define. That's correct. Okay, so I think that's why you're seeing this approach of not defining it. If we wish to define that, it would probably require us to recharter the group. So you have a good point, and I'm not and quite clear point. how we sol how we solve that, um, but it doesn't appear to be something that we can solve today given the current charter. So that it just, I would just throw that out there to keep in mind about how do we, thinking about that in the future, we should think about rechartering or does it happen somewhere else? But, but it's a very valid point that we don't know how to answer. And that's why I, every time that I talk about authoritative, I put in brackets, right? Because it's outside the scope, right? Phil? Uh, I'll just add a comment and it sort of comes from the shared signals world. Um, one of the discussions early on is even for something like a session logout, when you're going across domains, which skim is intended to do, sometimes it becomes problematic and you're dancing around the question of access control. Who's allowed to do what? Is service X allowed to desert to cancel the login session of a user in domain Z? Um, that's always becomes the problem and the idea came out with events was an inversion of control. And in that sense, you could have the SaaS application saying, I'm not telling you what to do by sending you, pushing you a command to change the email to X, Y, Z. I'm just telling you the email was changed to X, Y, Z. The receiver is always the one who deals with its own access control and deals with its own authority and by receiving the event decides what to do in their domain of influence and that's how you get around the access control issue so this came up with security signals and it's part of the reason we've been proposing skim provisioning events because it implements this inversion of control and it gets you around the access control problem um, i'm not saying though that uh, uh, per George's comment, how do you know who's authoritative to what? That's still sidestepping that issue. That's so, for me. So, Phil, do you see that that is option three, that we have signals that are going to be pushed whenever? But but again, this is not a one-time event, right? So let's say the, the challenge of the extra array that are authoritative in the SaaS application how would signals address that use case? Well, you would, each time a change occurs to a subject's uh, attribute, you would just send that notification. Yeah, um, but, but, but then sure. it's all the time because he's authority, right? That's right. So every time there's a change, it's, it, it just flows across. And if, if that uh, application isn't deemed authoritative, you either wouldn't be taking the events in the first place or B, 
you would just ignore certain events that that you disagree with because you're free to make your own access control decision internally. I think George wants to comment. Yeah, so I, I think Phil, your inversion of control would work with um, the option one described here, is which is basically to say, you know, and and the current requirements that authorization is out of scope. It basically would say that a SaaS application, if it believes it has an update to the record, you know, may push that back to the server, and it is up to the server to determine whether it should accept it or not. Right, that puts the inversion of control back in the responsibility of the skim server, leaves authorization out of scope for the protocol as a whole, right? And then allows the server to make that determination of, hey, I received something from Google and it's an email address, so therefore I'm gonna accept it. And you know, I received some other element from Google and I'm not gonna accept it, right? And so you then you then basically put the requirements on how to handle that back into the skim server um, and 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 also sidestep the whole who's authoritative for what from a protocol perspective but, but, but let, let me try to clarify so what you are saying is that it's not option one because option one means that each uh, scheme element will be client and server it's option three where the server is going to do a, a signal to the client saying that there is a, a new, uh, there is an update or a new value for that field that they are authoritative. So it's an option three that is missing in here. Possibly, but I guess my question is, is in the context of option one, where you say the SaaS client, the SaaS application is acting as a server back to the IDM, which is acting then as a client in that context, right? It, in other words, I don't know that you need the pub sub model of shared signals in order to get the inversion of control that Phil was talking about. But I like the inversion of control as a mechanism to, to basically sidestep the authorization and basically force the receiver of this message from the SaaS application. The IDM receiving the message from the SaaS application is responsible for determining whether it can accept it or not, or whether it should accept it or not, yeah. right? Because that basically punts on the authorization aspect I was talking about earlier. Because in this model, and it's a problem of the last slide, I apologize again, each one of them will be client right. server, right? Yeah. And in that model, you don't even need signals because exactly. the normal process of the client and server, it's a bi-directional communication between them and they completely update. Right, so I think the key thing is, should the IDM receive a message out of band as a client, as a skim client, right? Correct. It is responsible for determining whether it should accept that message or not. And that right. is policy that we don't want to touch, right? Well, the I'm policy. Just, I, I think you could put that in the spec, right? Because it's basically saying it, it puts the control back on the IDM server as a place, but it's it, not scope. Awesome. Okay, so this is a reminder. This draft is to capture the use cases and requirements. And I think we're starting to get into the implementation. Details. Implementation. So in the interest of time, I've closed the queue. And for those who are still on the queue, if we can just be quick about it because you've now gone to the 20 minutes. So, so go ahead, Pam. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge what, what we heard. We heard some advice that there's a potential line to add to the spec and we'll, we'll make sure that we address that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Uh, Danny? Uh, hi, yeah, I just wanted to uh, sort of chime in and agree with uh, Apollo, Dean, and uh, I guess a few other folks. Uh, Right now, it's just so much simpler to have uh, what we'll consider, you know, the the, the IDM manage the logic for what actually is allowed to go where uh, versus putting a burden on potentially, you know, hundreds of SaaS application vendors to manage uh, uh, like the logic of when an attribute needs to be pushed based on what authorization they have. Like everybody's business logic and flow of data is going to be different. Okay, do you have next steps? No, uh, I think next steps will be to continue to do the documentation in the draft. I, I have and one next step for you. Me? It's not an adopted draft. I know, I know. So um, I think we should do that question now. So my question to the group, uh, do you know how to run the polls? Sorry. So we're gonna put it on the poll, so please use the meet echo. 
So the question is, who has reviewed the draft? We've got four. Four? Not enough. Okay. So, um, of those who have not reviewed, we'd like to get a couple more reviews before we can do the adoption call. So, can I get a couple more volunteers to chime in? Dean and Anjali? So, I don't... Hans. So for the note takers, if you can note Dean Sachs, Anjali, I can figure out her last name letter, <laughs> and Hans. We'll review. And then for those who have reviewed it, if you can at least acknowledge, we want to get a sense of whether this is a good starting base for us to adopt and move forward. Because we did, and I'm saying it this way because as part of the charter, we agreed that we needed such a document, okay? All right, thank you, Pablo. Next up, Mike. And I will recuse myself. <laughs> Do you want me to share? Um, I, can, I can share with the mic. The X on the floor makes me nervous. That's because they're recording you, so just uh, oh, don't I, move. I won't dance. I mean, I may dance, but I won't. <laughs> you move. you can. <laughs> you, would you like some music? Well, what what do you have? I wasn't aware that this was a possibility. Take your pick. I got Spotify. Well, I can't find. You can't. Button. Here we go. Oh, you got it. Hi everyone, Mike Kaiser from Sailpoint. Huh? I have it. Just so everyone knows who I am. Okay. Just here to give you an update on the SKIM events spec that's underway. Um, next slide from the last time, only a couple of updates. Um, one is that we set up a new sub registry for events within the SKIM SEMA URN registry for Miana. There's a minor fix. You can see the email threads, uh, just basically a wording change and location change. And then an update to uh, asynchronous event delivery, which we talked about last time, um, basically adding an error response sample and then added bulk request for async events. Next slide. A little more detail on that. Uh, just to refresh, um, basically what happens is you add a header uh, with the value respond async per RFC 2740. And it responds with, yeah, the preference is applied, and it returns a transaction ID for later on correspondence uh, for events getting back. So the question was for bulk events on the next slide. Basically, obviously, if there's already a use case for async requests, bulk is going to take even longer if it's already an issue. Um, and so there's obvious value in supporting this kind of a response. Also it means that now the, the full range of uh, protocol requests can now be async. So the question was, how do you handle uh, multiple operations doing it via async? And so the proposal that is in the draft now is the next slide, give you a little more detail. Uh, basically the same initial response as any request, basically putting uh, that in the header for async. And then an event is going to come back for each operation in the bulk request. If you remember, uh, when it comes back and says, yes, we're applying async, it gives you a transaction number. Now, each event, uh, each com event comes back for each of those operations, and they're sequentially numbered dash n, dash 3, dash et cetera, et cetera. In the draft, there are examples of what this looks like. You can see an example on the next slide. Uh, Basically, if you look at the transaction uh, right here, you can see it's got the transaction number. There's an event coming back for this particular uh, uh, request in the bulk request. And you can see it's dash one. And it comes back with the, uh, the event response so that the original requester knows what had happened with that particular request from the bulk uh, via async. Next slide. 
Um, so that's, that's the only real two changes. One was minor and one was the, the bulk, as we talked about. Uh, there are a couple of invitations that Paul has going. I mean, Phil has going, not Paul. Um, and there are a few more that I know about that I'm not at liberty to disclose, but I know people are working on these in different, different aspects. Um, the next draft will have the minor wording fix that I talked about in the email thread. Um, is there anybody in the queue or any questions? I, I don't know. Phil, are you in the queue? No, I was just going to help out if there are any questions. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Phil's ready. Uh, assuming there are, are no questions or comments, uh, we feel like, I think at this point, we've responded to most of the, the inquiries and calls for adjustment. And so uh, I was wondering if the next step might be for a working group last call. It's up to you, David. Are there any questions about this <laughs> so far? Or just has, I guess we should do another another poll uh has everybody actually reviewed the changes since since the last uh has who has reviewed the latest version of the draft i'm gonna do the same poll again Okay, only a couple. We got to get better about doing our homework. Um, I do think we can uh, put out. I do think we can probably put out a working group last call on the list uh, shortly after this. But it would be nice to get some reviewers before we actually do that. Um, so let's do this again. Can we get some other people to commit to reviewing this? Hopefully, some other volunteers, uh, so that we're not putting all the work on the same people. I'll have to volunteer, but somebody's got to hold my feet to the fire a little bit on it. Fair, great. If I might also suggest, uh, as, a, as a reminder, when we do the working group last call, if you're very happy with the way the document is and don't want any changes, can you just tell the working group list, I looked at it and it looks great for proceed with publication and I support it. So we don't just need negative, you know, nits and kind of comments uh, kind of on it. So positive affirmation helps us too. Thank you. Great, so we got um, Elliot, anybody else can? Pam? I'm willing to volunteer too. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, Pam and Paulo. Fantastic, great, so that's three for that. Um, that sounds great. Let's try to follow up on that. Um, we've been having the, uh, we've been doing our informal biweekly calls uh, so we can follow up on the mailing list on that schedule and maybe catch up during one of those calls. Uh, Jennifer? Hey, um, I do think we need to spend a little more time with the async bulk. Um, just, I feel like there were a few loose ends in our last meeting, so I wouldn't feel comfortable yet moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, could you, can, could you have, actually, have you put, those concerns onto the mailing list yet? Uh, I don't know if I've talked about it in the mailing list or broad. No, I, I think I have, but maybe in the next meeting we could chat about it or I can bring them up now, <laughs> whatever we like to do. We do have a few minutes to continue discussion, so happy to use this time now for that. Yeah, so, um, and Phil, I'm, I'm not sure if we already discussed this, but if you go to the previous async slide, yeah, um, I did have some concerns using the dash one at the end to mark um, like different transactions over, you know, like transaction one, two, three, uh, because often the transaction ID would be a UUID with dashes already in. And if we're not like restricting, um, I think it's just alphanumeric, then it could get a bit confusing um, to use the dash as the separator. I mean, it would be the last dash, but um, I was thinking about that. We, would a different separator 
work? Yeah, maybe like a hash um, could be better. Okay. So it's minor, but. Um... Yeah, I, I, I think that's, yeah, it's quite common for people to put dashes in UUIDs, so I do see the, um, the issue. Um, I'll try and look into that. I, I don't know if anybody uh, has any concerns with hash. Um, uh, I'll look into it. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing was, um, would it be good to know how many transactions you're expecting for the bulk grouping? Um, so, you know, we're marking transaction one, two, three, uh, but how does the receiver know when it's done? I think it should know because it sent the request originally. So it should expect if it sent uh, 10 transactions, it should expect to get 10 events. I wouldn't want to overload the protocol with, um, you know, uh, I mean, we could, but then you'd be going like hash one slash 10 or something. Yeah. Um, um, also be, important, yeah. also important. And uh, this is just a, another detail. I specified that the counter is the operations as originally specified by the requester. If you go back into the skim bulk definition, uh, the group agreed that uh, implementers are free to optimize the order. Um, so what you could have if that ha actually happened, and this is from the original skim protocol, if the operations are proceeded at a sequence, they still required the result set to be given the way it is, and we wouldn't be changing that. Um, but what you might detect then is that the time of the event or the issued at for the event is not in sequence, even though the counter is in sequence. And that's how you would detect if it was processed out of sequence if you needed to. That's super techie, but. Yeah, no, that makes uh, sense. I think my biggest concern was if, you know, one of your. Um, transactions never came back you're just kind of waiting for it um, but you don't know if you should resubmit it um, because you didn't re like receive an error back so that might be more like implementation but um, um, yeah. we could put in text that says you should you should uh, uh, be returning uh, an equal number of events for the number of operations submitted. Um, I don't know. I think know that would that be good. Adds much. But it, okay. it maybe doesn't add much, but. Yeah. I mean, I, you, I there's didn't... no assumption that all your errors would need to be handled in async response yeah. back. So it would help caller a lot. Well, the, so the, the bulk endpoint requires that all the errors be returned anyway, so we would be issuing those same events. So it would have the same behavior as in seventy in the original skim protocol. Oh, then if that's the case, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like there's um, if that. That issue is we have a path forward on, and uh, the other point you raised about the separator, I'm going to go back and change that. So we have a couple of tweaks to make to the draft uh, before we sh should review the, the next version of it then, right? So um, that means for the people who volunteered to review, should wait until the, the you're reviewing the next version of it um, so oh. that you're looking at the most current. Yeah, I already had to make a change for the... IANA stuff. So I'll just put this in. It shouldn't take long. I'll have draft four out as soon as possible. Perfect. Okay. So, um, oh. No, I just want to process clarification. So what I heard is we're going to mint a dash four and dash four is going to go work in your class call. Is that what I heard? I wasn't sure. 
it's that sounds that sounds right to me. It sounds like if if those were the last discussion points, we have a path forward on them. So sounds good. And the people who volunteer it are going to review. And the people who volunteered will review it before we put it to a working group last call. Great. So okay, publish draft four. Um, we'll get the a couple of reviews, um, feedback, ideally on the mailing list, um, so we can keep track of it. And then, assuming there's no massive uh, issues discovered in those reviews, then we will uh, do the working group last call on the list. Okay. Sounds good. Ready? We've got uh, All right. this. Next up. You want to try it? There we go. Okay, first of all, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm speaking on behalf of Muhammad and Hassan, who are not here today. Um, this is an update on draft IETF skim device model. Uh, dash zero one is what's currently out. Um, the uh, uh, next slide, please. So uh, just as a recap, uh, this, uh, this draft um, sort of turns skim around, whereas normally uh, you have the, the, the enterprise deployment uh, um, calling out to uh, a resource server like um, Salesforce or WebEx or whoever. Um, this uh, the way this works is the, um, device, uh, the device provider uh, is the skim client, uh, enterprise's skim uh, server. Uh, the model is modular. We already have uh, BLE, Zigbee, and, and Wi-Fi DPP defined. Um, we actually have interest from uh, FIDO uh, in terms of doing FIDO device onboarding. Um, probably know we're going to need to do something like wired. I don't know if it's going to be wired DPP, but something wired. Uh, I expect we'll see something from Matter, and I imagine we'll see um, some interest in doing something with NOcean. Now, you might not know what NOcean is. Uh, NOcean is like a really thin wireless standard. Roman, you would be horrified by its security properties, uh, but it's the sort of thing where you, you, you have, you're doing energy harvesting with a button and you get your eight bytes out and that's that. So the form of security it generally has is um, proximity. Um, Let's see, the work is also relevant to another draft, uh, draft uh, Brinkman NIPSI, which stands for non-IP control. Um, and NIPSI is being presented in AS, was presented in ASDF um, um, as they are rechartering. Um, and it will be presented in, a in IoT Ops just after this meeting. Next slide. Okay, um, we made rather small changes in the draft this time. And I think each of these were discussed on the working group. Um, a mobility bit was added. We intended to add. We, we, we intended to add this actually in um, the base draft, and somehow I blew a commit. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, this was discussed. Um, we made some non-normative corrections to the Open API model. There were some errors there. Um, client token became client token. This matched the running code that we have. Um, and uh, there are some folding changes. As it turns out, the IETF now has a folding uh, standard. We're not yet compliant to it. Um, I will fix that at some point. Um, so the big news is that we have an implementation. Um, and uh, so on the URL there, which is in the slide deck, and I'll, I'll send this around the skim mailing list too, it is uh, github.com slash IoT onboarding slash tie dye. Um, yes, tie-dye is misspelled. There were arguments over this. I lost. Um, the, so the implementation um, combines the work of NIPSI and SKIM. Um, so you provision a device onto the network, and then for non-IP control, you can actually control it. We had a, um, a side meeting yesterday to talk about this, uh, and we had pretty good discussion about it. And we're having a lot of fun with the code. Um, we look forward to a lot more um, implementations. Um, issues wanted, um, committers wanted, PRs to the draft that, um, will, uh, that we want the implementation to match, most welcome. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so we have some big issues that are still hanging out in the draft. Um, the first of which, um, Danny, I hope you're listening because this one's for you. Um, in in uh, IETF 17, uh, 117, there was a request to handle non-IoT device provisioning. Um, and uh, where we left things there was that um, if these were, I, I would say, relatively incremental changes or, or changes that fit neatly with what's there, then I think we'd go one direction and just incorporate. Otherwise, we should um, probably bifurcate. We have to figure out which is the appropriate a way to go, but I don't actually know which way to go because I don't know what the proposal would be. Um, so um, again, uh, proposals welcome. Um, we had a bit of a discussion, Phil, right, with versioning, and we're not quite, I think, closed on that. And one of the issues that we have to close on first is do we do like a per model version or a per object version? And we, we can actually go both ways. Um, and I, I actually have I don't really have a, a, a strong view on it. I think um, at the end of the day, we're probably not going to do a lot of updating of just you know one document with one with one object, but we might do a couple at a time. And so it might make sense to go at the object level. It's sort of the direction I'm leaning, but I'd like the working group's view on how best to, to, to expose versioning here. And I really need a little bit of help on it, to be honest. Um, now, um, next point is uh, security considerations. Um, and as we have the security AD in the room, um, he'll be very disappointed to know that it is really just TBD at the moment. Um, however, I have been Ding, at least in my head. Um, the, the, there are some issues that are substantial that we need to cover in the security considerations for this model. The device provisioning functions um, require credentials to be sent um, relating to the device. So this is something that does require some thought, some, some serious consideration, um, and some understanding of when the model is appropriate, uh, when it is not appropriate, and what the limitations are. So um, it's impossible, for instance, for a device to that only supports a passkey function uh, it, at the end, at the end, the provisioning system needs the passkey, for instance, in order to access the device. Um, but if that provisioning system isn't speaking for the end user, the device, in terms of control, then maybe this function isn't appropriate. So we're going to have to put some words around that. Um, so the other thing is that it may be possible to split the difference and allow for encryption over the top in some cases. There, in fact, that might be very important. In some, uh, in some examples, like uh, the one that we are currently implementing is in healthcare. The last thing the plumbing us want is to have to worry about uh, HIPAA compliance um, because, we're looking, because we have access to the bits. So we really actually don't want to look at the information, but it means that there needs to be encryption on top. Um, as, as we, but that's mostly that's an issue more for um, NIPSI than for this. Um, now, the IANA considerations also need to be filled out. Um, this is something I also I'll need help with. Um, so at the skimmers dinner tonight, I'm going to ask for people to give me some guidance. So there'll be homework. Um, and maybe there'll be reward, too. I don't know. I can send chocolates to the person who has the best example. But And then you, we, we can actually compete, because Bart comes from Belgium, and I'm in Switzerland. And you can look at the chocolate and compare. No yeah, that's right. <laughs> We, we agree on that one point. It's just which way the, the, the needle goes. Um, uh, extensibility is an issue that we want to make sure we cover in the draft. It's not quite there yet. Um, extensibility means that uh, really there are going to be different connectivity technologies. If we go back to a previous slide, you'll notice one technology that wasn't on the list was LoRa. Uh, believe it or not, we've had requests to, to, do, to do something for LoRa on this. And it seems to make sense. Um, so actually what I'm thinking about doing is taking one of these and then testing an extensibility mechanism with it. Um, and probably the one that's least, you know, may, maybe the one that's least likely to be broadly implemented. So if you screw it up, we don't screw it up too badly. Another approach would be if we screw it up, we better learn quickly. Uh, and so maybe we just do that in an implement implementation draft, um, 
uh, analogy is the, the way that, that HTTP, HTTP had worked. Can you explain quickly. what LoRa is? Uh, LoRaWAN is a, um, uh, it, 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 it's a low bandwidth uh, 802.15.4 uh, technology that is that, that goes a little bit further than say the Elliot's meant to be on cell towers and such. So you get a little broader coverage, but sometimes it's used indoor as well, especially in places like factories. Um, okay, so um, a couple of slides forward, maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, next slide. So um, all this having been said, sort of towards the end of the spring, we, we'd like to be complete. So we actually want to move relatively quickly. Um, we're, we're actively developing the code, um, which means we're actively developing the drafts that are attached to the code. Um, and we're looking for collaborators on that too. Um, we've got a, a lot of work to, to do. Um, so I would also therefore like a pony. Um, if we can actually complete this in time, I, I, think, I think I should deserve one. Um, the code is right there. Uh, is the, so we, there are two GitHub URLs. The one that was earlier was for the code. This one is for the draft. I think I have an issue with the chairs at this point in terms of where you want the draft to, to reside. Um, I'm only really making any changes to the draft that um, assuming they're non-editorial, the only ones that would be made would be ones that are, are at least brought to the attention of the working group first, as is, I think, I tradition. I gave you the link. I'll send you the link again. OK. And that's it. Questions, discussion? Danny, got a proposal for me? There you go. <laughs> uh Yes, I'll just uh, apologize for being like, hey, I think we should do X, and then disappearing off the face of the earth, as far as you're concerned. But uh, I, I have been trying to uh, get to the point of having a proposal for you. So. OK, I'll ping you again before the end of the year if I don't hear from you. Yeah, let's do that. OK. Hi, Dean Sachs from Amazon again. Um, Elliot, I, I co-chair the Enterprise Deployment Working Group at FIDO. Um, and so you and I have some shared interest here. Uh, I expect we'll talk at dinner tonight and talk about ponies as well. Um, but uh, I, I, um, I, I think there's some, some really interesting ideas to how you can use Skim to pre-provision, say, FIDO devices like hardware keys. Um, and I'm not sure that's exactly what's happening with uh, the recent Okta thing that came out, but um, it, it, this seems like an area that we should explore as we talk about this draft. So I'll be happy to bend your ear over that at dinner tonight. Right, so um, let me just say, add a couple of comments on this. So I've been working with Jeff Cooper on this mm -hmm. um, from, you know, from Intel. Um, what we've really recognized is that what's, what the skim model here provides is um, a dispatch function in the enterprise, right? The dispatch function is, oh, this is a, a, a BLE device using uh, pass keys. Here's, here's the next process uh, that you're going to go to. Or this is a Wi-Fi device using uh, you know, DPP. Here's the dispatch function that you're going to go to. Or a matter device. For FIDO, right, what that, for FIDO device onboard, there might actually be several different dispatch functions like one for wired in terms of what you do and, and re relating to the rendezvous server or one for um, what you might need to do in wireless, which might be a little different. And so um, now I'm not, I am not the FDO expert as it happens. Nor am I. Right. So I figured I'd just go to the FDO experts and have them help me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so I, I think there's, in addition to the FDO use case, I'm thinking hardware keys. Like I have a bucket of hardware keys with enterprise attestations on them and we can talk about all the details at some point, but um, I could pre-provision those and then assign them to users and you would effectively, you could effectively use a mechanism like that to pre-provision that credential. And then once the user receives that hardware key, you have to have a way to unlock the hardware key in order to use the credential. And that mechanism is, is undefined and, and probably far out of scope for Skim. But I think it's an interesting use case that we can, we can certainly discuss. Yeah, Dean, the other use case that I think is directly related, I think that brings in a couple of different aspects. 
the access control within the skim model becomes a very important aspect there. We have a similar use case involving WebEx devices where the device might get provisioned from the, uh, from the partner, which in this case would be Cisco. Um, uh, and then the deployment needs to may want to fill in some details like, oh, this device is going to go to so-and-so. And once they do that, right, you get a really nice um, a zero touch experience from the user's perspective. So yeah, absolutely, we're, we're interested in that use case. And I think it also might bind to the work that's going on in EAP this week relating to um, the EAP FIDO uh, 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 presentation that was given in EMU. Great, I look forward to hearing about that from you. Okay, other questions, comments? I think there's one other person. Cam? Cam's on the camera. Yeah, I have, I have one. Um, hey, hello, I wish I was there with you all. Um, so quick question. I think this all makes a ton of sense and I think it's very straightforward and I would love to see us get this out of GitHub and into data tracker um, if possible. But the one concern I have, I, you know, this is gonna sit in a pantheon of resource types. And my one concern is that device is a very generic word here. And that I think there could be a future need for devices that are not these kinds of devices, but might be more um, commonly used by people who need to have a memorable or, you know, thoughtful name. Um, have you thought about whether there's a more specific name you could give to this resource type to, to differentiate it, say, from smartphones or laptops or other things that might be more prevalent in the enterprise? Um, it's, a, it's a fair question. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'm going to struggle to answer it, but um, let me give you my best shot. In my view, right, in my world, I, I connect devices. Um, so it could be that we're talking about a network device. Um, you know, I have a very network centric focus and this is about provisioning the network, um, the, the, the customer deployment as far as, you know, what I do at Cisco. Um, so we could call it something like network device information, if you would rather. Um, but what is more, what is really important to me is to tr try to provide the appropriate horizontal solution across all the types of devices that you're talking about, right? Now, I'm I'm up for other approaches. I just I don't have a great answer beyond that. Well, I will say that I don't think the industry has a good answer. This is a I think a pervasive problem in the industry that we don't, you know, that devices is an overused term. So, but maybe uh, it, just it, as a bug in your ear. Absolutely fair point. We could call it something like IOT device. I mean, I'm not sure that's much better. Um, network IOT device networking provisioning information, if you'd rather. Um, I'm, I'm really up for, you know, anything that the working group might, might think more appropriate. Bart, Bart. Cut yeah, it might also be really interesting to see if we could actually have a generic device category and if other use cases would fit into it too. So yeah. instead of having, you know, many different types of devices, if we potentially could get to one device class that, you know, covers multiple use cases. So that, that was um, Bart Brinkman. Uh, Bart is a, a, a first time IATF attender. Uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. And um, so he hasn't had to um, suffer the grand unification theory of device models before here. Um, so uh, there may be there may be some pain hiding there that that I think uh, Pamela is uh, uh, going towards. We have two minutes, Danny. Go ahead. No, I dropped that here. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll give you, because we did adopt the draft. We did adopt the we draft. We did adopt the draft. So just, it's just giving you the uh, repo in the uh, yeah. skim org. And, yeah, and just working and working and working. And, you yep. know, and as much as we're doing interims, we'll need them. Yep. Okay. okay. Sounds Thank good. Thank you. All right. Queries, Delta queries. Hello, everyone. So I'm Anjali from AWS. And myself and Danny have worked together on Skim Delta queries. 
In last IETF, we presented uh, some concepts um, around Delta Query. We had at that point in time two options, uh, time-based approach versus um, a change database and how we go about it. Uh, so during the past few months, we have aligned on an interface uh, layer that uh, aligns or that abstracts the implementation out of it and would be able to support both kind of implementations. So uh, I'll go through those. Next slide, please. So what is the goal of, of this draft? So we do have provisioning APIs within Scheme. What we are missing is we don't provide efficient APIs where some scheme implementers can implement a reconciliation mechanism or identify changes or deltas within the system. So we, we all look forward to an ideal system where things would happen perfectly and there are no uh, divergent data, but, but that's not the reality. So things always go wrong and we may have divergent data apart for, even though we have a sync, syncing system. So what this draft goes through is providing a set of APIs that can efficiently detect changes uh, within the server and report, and those APIs can then be used by uh, skin client implementers to compare the data set, the changes from what they have in their system, and then take actions, necessary actions. Maybe it's uh, reprovisioning uh, of that item or, or manual intervention to fix that issue. Maybe they detect a bug which can get fixed. So the whole draft is around providing a new interface uh, or extending the existing interface to support for getting incremental updates on resources that have been updated or deleted within the scheme server. So we do have existing APIs to list all users or list all groups, which can be used to get the full set of data and compare it with what's in the scheme client and detect the changes. But that becomes a performance nightmare when we have large scale of data. And this API provides you changes to be retri retrieved uh, from a point, in a point in time or a reference point of the last scan. So, uh, this is what we are going to uh, propose. So let's go to the next slide. So we have uh, put together some key requirements on uh, these APIs regarding their behavior, like resources modified since a specific point in time um, point can be returned by a query. Now with modified, it could be created, newly created, updated, or deleted. What it returns is current state of resources so that you can compare uh, with your scheme client what the current state is and find the deltas. Able to convey um, that a previously existing re resource was deleted from a specified point in time, just reiterating that uh, we want to retrieve deleted uh, objects as well. And ability to convey changes to group memberships. And we want these APIs to be performant at large scale with accurate results. And any other uh, requirements that uh, anybody else from the group think about, then we are, feel free to provide us as feedbacks. So we can add it in the draft. Next slide, please. So how does it all work? So the way it works is the first step is obtaining the first Delta token. So we are extending the existing uh, resource URI, so get users with the Delta query parameter, which is a Boolean parameter. And as the client sends this request, in response, it will get um, everything that the server has. So this is like not different than what your existing get user will do, but with a small change that on the last page or on the last response, it will return a next Delta token, which can then be used by the scheme client uh, to uh, send a new Delta query and only ask for changes that have been done post this uh, point in uh, reference. So as part of this uh, first query, this we call it as a full scan, it returns all the resources that currently exist in the collection. It does not return any prior deleted records uh, uh, that have already been removed from the system. The resources returned will represent the latest state of the resource at the processing time. And in the response, it returns a next Delta token, which is basically a uh, a marker or a reference for the server to detect, okay, this is the point in time I have, uh, or point that I have returned records, records up to in this request. And when this client sends the next request, I need to send records that have been modified after this reference point. 
This token is opaque to the client, so client should not assume any um, meaning out of it. This is just um, uh, the server to understand it and decode it to, uh, to execute the next request. Uh, next slide, please. So as step two, once the client has done a full scan, um, they can uh, send a next uh, uh, Delta uh, query, which is, we call it as a Delta scan. It's up to the client uh, at what interval they want to send. It could be five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, the quicker they send, they will get less, like, I mean, the payload size would be lesser and they would be uh, more uh, closer to what has been, uh, uh, what has been out of sync in the system. In response to the Delta scan query, the server will return uh, only the resources that have been modified. That means either they are created or updated or have been deleted after the point represented by the Delta tokens value. Resource returned will represent the latest state of the resource at the time of processing, and it will again deliver a next Delta token and the last page of the Delta scan response, which can then further be uh, executed by the scheme uh, client to get the next set of changes. So this will allow the the, the biggest uh, thing, uh, biggest benefit that this provides is that your amount of like data that has been returned is is lesser and lesser, and uh, it becomes much efficient and faster. Next slide, please. So this is just reiterating that um, of what is the changes to the represa resource representation. So the newly created and updated resource, uh, there's not change, no additional change to their existing uh, state or response payload. They will use the standard representation and the current state is returned. For deleted instances, we are proposing a, a change in the meta um, um, attribute, uh, complex attribute to add an additional field called is deleted, uh, which basically depicts that these are the deleted uh, resources. We only intend to get some meta information so that the client is able to compare it with the record in their system and understand which record has been deleted. Next slide, please. So we have also considered some pagination uh, considerations just to iterate. Um, so this draft is um, considering like if you are using uh, cursor-based pagination and the server has implemented. So if you are returning the Delta uh, query, uh, response, then it will return next cursor to paginate through the responses. And only on the last page, it will return uh, the next Delta token. And in each query to return a next page, uh, this client would send the same Delta token that it had provided for the first page. This just aligns with what we have also proposed in the cursor-based pagination that the, while you are paginating, the query parameters should stay the same. Um, Next slide, please. So the client can retrieve the subsequent pages by providing the cursor value um, in the parameter. Uh, rest of the URL remains the same as in the first page request. And subsequently at the last page uh, on the cursor-based pagination, uh, on the Delta query response, the server re will respond with the next Delta token. Next slide, please. So that's just represented in this uh, request uh, response. You can see here, uh, there is an else next Delta token responded because this is the last page of this current scan. Next slide, please. So uh, we are putting some normative requirements so that because we are not going on the implementation scenarios or giving guidance on how it should be implemented, but we are making sure that we, the draft has enough normative guidance that it drives the requirements. So service providers must not present resources from being updated uh, while implementing uh, this query. So we're not proposing that there is any locking mechanism to, the, uh, to be done on the underlying resources. This query is completely stateless. Uh, new items can be added or existing items can be removed uh, while paginating through the response of the, the either the full scan queries all the de Delta client scan queries. The Delta query, however, must guarantee that we do not skip any records while paginating. So if there have been updates uh, to the underlying data source where new records have been updated, but they were not responded back in the current Delta scan query, they must be returned in the next Delta scan query. So that's something that server has to manage as to what point they are 
you, uh, they are returning this Delta, uh, uh, Delta token and that considers uh, that there are no records missed between the two scans. Next slide, please. So this is just addition to server provider configuration. This, this functionality is definitely not uh, mandatory. So servers implementing it can uh, uh, provide an information whether it's supported or not. So that clients can uh, decide if they can be, if they are able to use this uh, API or not. Next slide, please. For group memberships, um, uh, Scheme currently does not support uh, pagination on large, complex, multi-value attributes such as group memberships. So, along with Delta Query, how we propose, how we anticipate this can be done is basically in the Delta Query not only for group attribute changes, but also if there are additions or removals to the group membership, uh, the, 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 the group will be returned as part of the Delta query. And for each group returned in above query, uh, you retrieve the current active members of each effective group by using uh, filters. That's what is supported today. And then you compare the group members and receive, the, uh, receive from the above query with your current state and, and with the source system. Above approach works, but in case the uh, groups contain large sets of members, this approach is, is becomes inefficient. So we're looking for inputs of uh, what else can be do in the draft, what extensions can be ma made so that um, we can make this process more efficient. Next slide, please. So yeah, so uh, we have not able to publish. Uh, so we have this draft um, in the GitHub repository. We will be publishing it in the data tracker probably next week. So we're looking for feedback, input, PRs, and issues uh, so that we can make this uh, draft better. And for us, next steps are um, getting more feedback uh, and updating this draft um, with those feedbacks and, um, and moving forward with it. So Anjali, you can um, post this on the data tracker. Yes. And when you do, just remind the people on the skim me list and solicit feedback there. Yes, yes, I'll do that. Go ahead, Danny. Uh, yeah, uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I guess I'll chime in, add what to, uh, sorry, to um, what Anjali uh, presented and say that the draft that is in GitHub that's about to go into the data tracker, uh, we've decided essentially, you know, at certain points to just make a decision on something, like you know, to write something for some of the approaches. Uh, I, I know within you know the working group, both on the mailing list and in uh, you know previous meetings like this, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on this. It's a very complex topic. There's been a lot of history across identity and other uh, centers like LDAP. Uh, not like we, neither of us are, uh, I guess, asserting that uh, any or all of what we've written is the best way to do something, but or you know, laying out a foundation so, to start discussion and hopefully get us to uh, do something serviceable. So, yeah, uh, feedback, please. Great, Pam. So right now the spec talks about um, you have to do what they what the spec calls a full scan query to get the first delta token. What if the collection is too large to do a first full scan query? I mean, you have to start at some point where you have uh, the full scan and. Uh, um, like, can you explain like when you say that. Um, collection is too large to, like what other mechanisms you are uh, pointing to? Well, you, you may have uploaded a CSV file, for example. Like there are a bunch of ways to bootstrap um, a collection, right? Yes. Not all of them are skim based. So is there a way to get a token based on that or a way to get a token on a partial or a, a way to get a token maybe just on a um, an object like just only requesting object names rather than entire objects. Does that does any of that work? Uh, we we can take that input, uh, look into it, but I'm not sure if if we can because the the reference point is that what has the server returned. So 
we can if we as make an assumption that the skim client assumes that whatever the the two data uh, the two systems are in sync and we just want to start from moving on from this point onwards then yes we can look into an approach where a, a delta token can be responded back instead of doing a full scan but that just based on an assumption that we are assuming that before this point the two systems have the data Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Phil, did you want to say that on the mic? Uh, sure, Phil. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, yeah, could you just ask for a token as of now? Yes. Because yes. the client already knows and you you just don't want the data. Yes, yes. I think that that's uh, something that we can add to the draft. Dean Sachs from Amazon again. Um, Anjali, I'm, I'm desperately racking my brain to remember, can you get the initial query from a search to then get a Delta token? And I think that addresses uh, Pam's question about instead of having to do a, uh, a full scan of the database, you could do a subset of that with a search and then get a Delta token from there. Yes, and I would like to add, I didn't include it in the slide, but any filter parameters that uh, apply to any of those resources, they can be appended to the Delta query. So if you don't want to like do a full scan, you can always have a filter applied. And then uh, when you're doing the next Delta scan, then you, you use the token and apply the same filter. So Perfect. that's Thank possible. You. Yeah. Uh, to uh, chime in a little more on that as well. Uh, uh, when we were writing the first version of the draft, uh, this is a topic that Anjali and I did discuss. Uh, essentially, yeah, it could be summarized as whether or not the uh, the Boolean uh, delta query parameter to kickstart things uh, needed to be tied to sort of an initial sync, or can you pull, or like, can you precisely what's being asked? Can you uh, use the, uh, the the watermark for, for like for, you know with not the exact same scope necessarily, or like? Uh, a you know a partial query or really anything to say this is the point in time can you can you issue the token and then use it to um for a different query or a different set of results later uh and yeah uh we can uh i guess look at uh f feedback and uh figure out what the uh what the right direction is Paulo. Paulo Correa. So couldn't we get the token in the initial sync? So when you have the client doing the initial sync with the server, the last thing that is provided in that initial sync will be the token. Because we assume that when you do the initial sync between the client and the server, then the server has exactly the same information. Only from there on, the information is going to change. Yeah, so that's what we are saying that yeah. once the client has done the full sync, initial, sync, initial sync, they can uh, just call this query without doing a scan, like getting the full result and just get the token. So that just sets the baseline. So we are basically in the first, first point is setting up the baseline. Now, how do you set up the baseline? You either are sure that whatever right now is in both sides is perfectly synced, and we just need a token to set up the baseline and we don't return the actual full set of resources. We just give you a token back. The server gives you a token back. Okay, this is your baseline token. And now you can use this Delta token in your subsequent queries to just get the changes. The other option is if you already have the data uh, in both systems and you're not sure that it's in sync, then you can do a full scan and also get a, a baseline token like a Delta scan token. So you have both options. But w what will stop you giving the token e immediately when you are doing the sync and assuming that the server is only going to start to create the, I don't want to call it change database, you don't like it, but the, whatever we have after that, after they finish that process. So the token could be given immediately in the initial sync, right? But uh, how will server know that now the sync is complete from a, a scheme client perspective? Because scheme client is just sending post requests to the server. Server doesn't know that, okay, at this after this record, the sync is complete, right? So you the scheme ser client will still have to send something to say, oh, I'm done, I'm synced, right? So I think doing that get on a resource 
with Delta query. And maybe we yeah. add additional that only re need a token, not re need like all the resources is just setting up that baseline and getting the token. So, so what we are saying in here is that until you receive the token from a server perspective, there cannot be any change. That will be an implementation, uh, implementation decision from the server. So you cannot do any change to the data that you are receiving until you get that token. No, that's not what we are saying. That's still client driven. So client drives, no, when no. do they think that, okay, now the systems are in sync. So either they can do a full scan with the no, Delta no. query and get the token, or they can say, okay, I know I synced it just now. And now I'm, so when it sent the last record, the initial sync, it can just send a, a query to the server and say, give me the uh, token because mm -hmm. now is when I will start doing the Delta syncs instead of doing a, uh, no, like so, I'm going to start doing the Delta queries. So let yeah. me recap. So client is going to do the push with all the hackers. Yes. The last task that he does, he does, he does, he sends a, a, a get, a get mm -hmm. to the, give the token. To get what the I'm, token. To get the token. What I'm saying is that uh, the server will not do anything, will not start to create the audit log or the change the database or whatever, until he receives the get. So I'm some not kind sure of recommendation. Are, yeah, I'm not sure if we are trying to say that that server will only start to create a change log at some at a specific point in time. The server can create their change log because when they are getting this client updates, they can they will be managing their internal database to manage. Uh, but internal. then you can have inconsistency. I'm not sure because it's going to give you a token back from the point in time that it is sent the, all the records. Sure, but until that point that he, he sends the token back, then you are saying that if there isn't like a read-only state in the server itself, you Yeah, we're not, lock, you can we're have not proposing to lock any resources between server and client interaction, because that doesn't work out when you scale. But then uh, like we it. go back to what Pam was saying, right? Because it can take a very long while until you get mm -hmm. the initial token, and then you have inconsistency already there. I'm not sure if you will have inconsistencies. Why would you have inconsistencies at that point in time? Because it took too long but, for uh, that first token to happen. And at that point, there was hackers. That but it was... is it is going to give you the token at the end of the last page that has been returned. So it has basically given you all the updates when it is returned, returning you the token uh, until that point in time. And then it will just give you, uh, start tracking the rest of the changes after the token is given back. Okay, well, let's yeah, discuss yeah, offline. I'm yeah. taking this. Okay, question. okay, I will we'll work it out. My guys are from SailPoint again. Uh, Danny and Anjali, this is a great start. Thank you. Just wanted to start there. Um, I'm going to, I'll put in a PR after I talk to you about this, Anjali, about uh, maybe contributing some language to the approach, the early section of the document saying that if you're doing Delta queries and they're taking forever, that you might want to think about doing Delta queries more often because mm -hmm. the idea is you're not using huge yeah. pagination. Uh, question or two. Is it ever stated, I guess it's implicit that or implied that each token is sequential from the, the service provider side? Is that fair to say? We haven't stated it, but it would be. Okay. So you could get one Delta token and since the service provider isn't saving state, isn't saying I'm giving this token to this client per se. No, it's not client specific. It is global. So server doesn't keep track of what token it sent it to what server, uh, what client. So okay. it's a global. Yeah. So you could, you could technically request different resources with the same token. Um, In a, I mean, I'm not suggesting yeah, it. Yeah. I'm just thinking yeah, of, we, I'm thinking of point, abusive, yeah. uh, abuse of that, this that's approach a good point. in case we want to head, head yes. it off. Yeah. Um, so, and, and maybe a, another statement that's basically saying, it sounds like, and I agree with this, that responsibility for using it well and using it appropriately is He's put on, on the client, client. Yes. not on the server. Yeah. The server's not tracking server, what they yeah. do with it. Server takes the responsibility that 
whatever that pointer is, it doesn't misses any records in between if they have changed, but how you use the, the token that's on client side. Right. Okay. Thanks. We only have five minutes left, so let's keep this, oh, yeah. wrap this up. Um, Dean Sachs from Amazon again. Uh, I, I think, uh, Mike, to your questions, uh, kind of what we were talking about earlier downstairs is um, this is specking out the RESTful APIs and the interface between the client and the server. We're not specifying what the client does. We're not specifying what the server does. Those, those implementation details are outside of what Skim can specify. Um, it is simply about the interface that is between the two. And I think that be begins to address that question. Now, it may be unsatisfactory because the client may do things poorly or the server may do things poorly, um, but that is outside of the realm of what we can specify here in this room. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can put that under considerations too, by the way. That's a great idea, Nancy. Yeah. All right. Great. So I guess the next steps on this is upload it to data, publish a data tracker, which you can do now. The yeah. It's unlocked now. Um, and make sure to post an update to the mailing list. Yes. People definitely. can review it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. Any, any other business? I don't think so. Any other business? Going once? Going twice? We give you three minutes back. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. So let's just keep the dialogue going on the uh, mail list. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Look at that. By them opening the door, it dropped 100. Oh, now it's back up. As <laughs> I don't have time to put the report in the side. Oh, it's next. Okay. Yes. Do you want to upload the minutes or the minutes? Um, were yeah, I can, so I can. I can clean it up and upload. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to fill in some of the because I okay. don't know if you saw there I were wasn't. like question mark and the, and so I was like. Both of you guys need to tag team, right? So let me know if you need help or coaching on doing a working group last call. So just like I showed you this morning, yeah. you can ask for early review on the skin, just like I was supposed okay. to do that on the, okay. yeah. And you can call it early review or you can do you can do early review because we may end up doing a couple working group last calls on, this, on the events. Draft. If we make significant changes, then you have to do another okay. working group last call. Yeah. 